Hi, I'm Bill Witte, and you're listening to Redneck Theology Sermon Segments. These programs provide sermons for my home church, New Beginning Worship Center, in Greenback, Tennessee. The pastor is Brother Marcus Severance. Questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology at gmail.com. Now, let's listen to today's message. I'm glad you're here tonight. I always just want to tell everybody here tonight that you're a soul. Everyone else. And that God loves you. You know, some of y'all have been through trials and had your battles. But um, God is always faithful uh, to everyone else. He never uh, forgets us, no matter where we are, uh, no matter what we're going through. And uh, I'm thankful for that. You know, I look around and I see the great uh, thing that God's doing. He's doing this wherever He's allowed to do. He's not only doing it here, He's doing it wherever He's allowed to do. Why the age God's God's Spirit um, is alive. Uh, You know, I want to thank Him uh, for the work that He's done here. He's done wonderful things. Uh, for these young people. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, I've been in ministry for a long time now. Probably during our uh, vacation Bible school, we had some of the most incredible outpourings that I've ever seen, ever, upon our young people. But you know, the Lord, He, he always has something to say. And he knows the people that will be in the service. Uh, but tonight, I, I want to talk about um, a man called Abraham. And for a lot of these young people that are new in the Lord, and, and, uh, Abraham was a, a person that God had called before he was ever Abraham. His name was Abram. And he called him out of a place called Ur of the Chaldees. The, uh, the Bible talks about that, that actually that Abraham was a worshiper, but not of God at that time. He was actually a worshiper of the moon. He was a moon worshiper. And it said uh, uh, that his dad... Um, even church history talks about that his dad was somebody that built idols. They were they were idolaters, and but God came to him and, and uh, revealed Himself to him then, called him out of this place, uh, like He's called us out um, of a place that we used to be in our life. And so I want to go now to a time when Abraham is a lot older. Uh, as a matter of fact. Probably about this time, I would say Abraham was, and Sarah both were probably over 70 years of age, maybe 75. And the Bible talks about it, and this is where I take my text from tonight, out of the book of Genesis, in the 18th uh, chapter of Genesis. It says, And the Lord appeared unto him, speaking of Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. I want you to look at somebody and say Mamre. Just tell them, look at him and say Mamre. Mamre. The Bible says that the Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. I want you to remember that name because that's what I'm going to take my text from in just a minute. And the Bible says that he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. In verse 2 he says that he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo, there were three men that stood by him. And when he, speaking of Abraham, saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord... If now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. He said, Little, little water, I, I pray you be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts, after that you shall pass on. But therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do, as thou hast said. So anyway, I'm not going to read this whole passage of Scripture for, for, for the time's sake. But in this particular passage of Scripture, we see a man that once was an idolater, that that didn't know God. And and that was like us. You know, God doesn't deal with us like like that. He doesn't hold account against us. He doesn't say that, you know, you've done this. He doesn't say that you 
that you've done that. He doesn't point fingers. He doesn't, he doesn't criticize you. He doesn't, he doesn't look for ways to hurt you or to keep you out. He doesn't look for anything bad in your life. But God is always looking to bless. The Bible talks about where Abraham was. Listen to you. And he was in a place called the Plains of Mamre, which I just spoke of. And in this place, there was trees there. Actually, they, they talk about the trees that were in this plain. So what does that do to the message? A lot. Because Abraham was sitting under these trees. They were called, really they were called oaks. I've heard them called the oaks of Mamre. But if you study it out, they were trees that were called terebinth trees. There's a lot of significance in that. The terebinth tree was one of the oldest trees that was ever created. The terebinth tree is, is the place where Absalom was hung when he was in battle that time. Absalom, who, when he rebelled against David and, and, and hung his hair in, 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 the, in the Bible said in the oaks, actually in the terebinth trees. And there in that tree is where, where he died. The Bible also talks about the time that David came down through the Valley of Elah. There was actually a movie called, remember that movie years ago called The Valley of Elah? And it was, it was a hit in Hollywood. And David had come down, listen, through this valley to bring his lunch through his brothers. And this valley really was known as the Valley of the Terebinth Trees. He came down to fight somebody else's battle, to fight somebody else's war, because Saul would not fight the giant. But David stood up that day, hallelujah, and slew the giant, amen, as after he came out of the Valley of the Terebinth Tree. But I want you to see something about this. God had come to Abraham for a reason. God never uh, does anything by chance. Come on, somebody. You believe that. God, there's never anything by chance. It's not by chance that you're here tonight. It's not by chance that you're in this place tonight. God never does anything by chance. But God says that a good man steps. Our steps have been ordered by the Lord. Even though we've had our battles and our trials. And we've gone through many, many valleys. But we've always come out. And here in this particular time, Abraham is old. And, and, and he is well stricken in years, and so is his wife. And, and, he, and so during this time, and he's in the plains of Mamre, God comes down to speak to him. God, you know, I've heard it preached that it was God and, and two angels. I don't necessarily believe that. I've always said when they came down, they came down together. I believe it was God the Father. I believe it was God the Son. And I believe it was God the Holy Spirit. The Bible said that he ran. And he bowed himself before him, and he began to speak to them. And he said, if I have found favor in thy sight, aren't you glad tonight that you found favor Amen. in the sight of the Lord? Amen. Amen. You found favor tonight because of the blood. You don't find favor because you go to church. You don't find favor because you stand in the pulpit. You don't find favor in your life because you stand up in a praise team. You don't find favor, but favor comes because of the blood of the Lamb that God has shed over your life. That God looks down upon you and sees the blood. Come on, somebody, I'll preach all night. God said He looks down and He sees the blood of the Lamb of God, and, and God remembers His covenant like He did with Abraham. Amen. God came down because during this time, I'm sure that, that both of them had forgotten about the promise that God made, made them. God had made them a promise. He had told them that He would have an heir that would come forth from His own loins. And he, he, of course, got ahead of God. If He ever got ahead of God and got in trouble, I sure have. But He, but he got ahead of God. And he, he said, you know, I wanted to, Sarah came to Him and, and said, you know, take my handmaiden. Take, take Hagar as, as the handmaiden. And, and take her and, 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 and you will have an offspring. You will have an heir. But, but he, he, did, he shouldn't have listened to her, but He did. God's promises are yes. Let me tell you some of you. Listen to me. Just because God doesn't show up when you think He should, God will show up. Come on, somebody. Amen. God Amen. will come and He will answer that prayer that you've been believing Him for. Right. If you'll stand your ground. He, he made them a promise. When God makes somebody a promise, He'll never not, never not do what He promised He would do. He may not do it when you think He should. He may, you know, he may wake like Lazarus. It may be four days, but he shows up and he's always on time. Amen. Come on, somebody, Amen. give our God praise. Amen. God came down, and this is where I want to take my text from in the plains of Mamre. The word Mamre is what I want to preach about tonight that God has given me. I've been studying all day. God gave me this word about 4 30 this afternoon. I was in my bedroom praying, seeking God. The Bible talks about the plains of Mamre. 
Now I told you to remember. Look at somebody and say mamre again. Look at them and tell them, say mamre. This word mamre, this word that's taken from the terebinth trees in this valley, really it was it was a plain, but it also was a place of a valley because I'm sure that Abraham and Sarah had 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 their differences, had had their differences of opinion, had had their differences of what they truly believed. But God, it doesn't matter because God, when He makes a promise, He will always keep His promise. If you believe it, say Amen. amen. This word memory, if you look at it from the, from the text, the word memory means factors. You know, church, like our church right now, once it looked like we were a little bit thin. But because God has showed up and God has remembered what He said He would do and God is working in the midst, amen, and God has come down in power and God's Spirit is being poured out and the love of God is being shed abroad and amen. people are feeling this and people are being drawn by His Spirit. Now the place has become fat, amen. amen. Give God praise in this place. Amen. means fatness and I want to share with you how to become this way how to have a place where, the, where there is plentifulness, where there is supply where there is a promise first of all the Bible talks about Abraham and we sing this song the Bible says that Abraham was the friend of God I want you to think about this message tonight from the heart of God he was the friend of God he was not an enemy of God. He was not somebody that practiced his religion. He was somebody that lived the life that was pleasing unto God. Somebody yes. say amen. The Bible talks about in the book of Hebrews, it talks about, he said, without faith it is impossible to please God. Yes. Listen to me, young people. He said, for they that come to God must believe that He is. Yes. And the Bible says that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You know, it, it may take a long time in our, on our page. It may seem like it takes a long time. You know, I've said many times to God, I said, God, I don't have all the time that you have. I'm not eternal. I'm just a man. I've only been allotted so much time. But my point is, is the greatest thing that God will say about us and the greatest thing that could ever be said about you and about me is that we were the friends of God, that we were people that loved Him, that served Him, not, not for any other reasons, not, not to build a kingdom, not to build a name, not to be anything, but we served Him because of the great love that He's shown us, because of the promises that He said He would perform in our lives. He did not forget Abraham. He did not forget Sarah. And He will not forget you and I. He will come to us, praise God, when Abraham was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, sometimes it may be when it's the most oppressive time, when things look so bad, when things aren't going the way they should, when everybody else is gone, yeah, and you're out there by yourself, yeah. sitting in the tent door, yeah. which yeah. represents yeah. Christ. He is the door to the yeah. sheep yeah. He is the door yeah. to everlasting life. Yeah. He is the door yeah. to God yeah. that yeah. opens wide and shouts, come in freely yeah. and, and suck with I'm calling you. Abraham was sitting in the tent door in the most oppressive time of the day. But when he looked up, God is telling the church, look up your redemption. He's yeah. drawing yeah. now. Yeah. He looked up. I mean, can you imagine? He's looking out over this barren desert. The heat, who knows how hot it was. Heat, you remember days you've seen the heat just, it's so bad and you can see the smoke from it. And all of a sudden he's looking out there about six tenths of a mile and there's nothing. And then he looks again and all of a sudden here comes these three men walking. Wow, that gets me excited. Here they come. You didn't, have, you didn't hear me. I said, here they come. Yes. And they're not going just anywhere. They're coming to your house. They're coming to where you are. Hallelujah. Yes, yes I've seen them in Hollywood. that's yes, coming to a theater near you soon. <laughs> but glory to God, I've got something better than a theater. I've got something better than Hollywood. Yeah. His name is Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. His name is Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Because God's going to honor him. Yes. Yeah. He's going to honor you. know why he would call you the friend of God? You know what it is? All you, you know how simple this is. All you have to do is believe. Amen. Amen. 
The hardest thing that Jesus ever said, more people left Him than ever. The hardest thing that He ever said in the Scripture, they turned and left Him. He looked at His disciples. I'm not, I've always thought, thought about it all morning. I wanted to say it this morning. He wouldn't let me. He looked at His disciples. And He said, are you in Greenback later? He said, you boys are going to hook it and go to Peter stood up. See, God has a Peter somewhere. He has a John somewhere. God ha has people where He needs them at the time. He needs them. Come on. He'll always have somebody stand up in the midst when everybody else has turned and run. And Peter looked at him and said, Jesus. He said, where shall we go? Where are we going to go? There's nowhere to go. Where are we going to go? Where are we going to run to? He said, for you have the words of eternal life. Abraham was the friend of God. God didn't forget him. Abraham was the friend of God because not only, number one, did he get up and go, and he went to a place not knowing where he was going. You know, I know the church is going somewhere, but I don't know where, but I know it's going somewhere. Hey. You're not walking by sight. You're not walking by what you see tonight. Hey. You're walking by faith. Amen. Hey. You're walking with God, and you're walking by faith. Somebody give our God praise. Hey. You're going somewhere. Hey. myself, but I, but I know of people who have literally seen Him. And have literally sat in the presence of Jesus. Have seen Him face to face. And He has spoken to them. And I've, I've said to God even here recently, God, I said, if, if I could just see You like that. I said, I said I'm not going to let You go. I'm going somewhere. I said, I'm not going to let You go. I'm going to be like Jacob. I'm going to wrestle with you until you answer my prayer. I'm going to wrestle with you. I'm not going to let you go. This is something else I want you to understand. That in the plains of Mamre, there was a great wrestling going on in Abraham's life. Not because of him so much, but because of his wife. His wife was, was having a hard time. His wife was struggling with something in her life. But when God showed up, the first thing that he asked Abraham, he said, where is Sarah thy wife? He didn't say this or that or the other. He asked him a particular question. He said, where is Sarah thy wife? He said, she's in the tent. God began to speak. And God said, she's going to have a child. There's no way. Sarah even heard what the Lord said. Listen to me. Sarah even, even heard every word that he said. And, and she didn't think the Lord could see her or hear. But let me tell you right now, God sees you. And, and, and so does the enemy. God sees your faith and, and the devil sees your doubt. Hey. But let me tell you right now, let's get rid of our Thomas tonight, yeah. alright? Let's cast our Thomas out. Let, get, out. get rid of Thomas tonight, amen? I want to tell you something. That if you can believe and God went on to say, is there anything too hard for the Lord? I sat right here Wednesday night. I saw a woman healed, completely delivered by the power of God. I saw a woman come up here who had a debilitating back injury. Three of her vertebrae completely just gone pretty much. And we sat right here. How many people?
people in that service. You saw one, the only one that saw it in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. And the woman came to the altar. And I remember, I don't remember all of what happened. I, and I give God all the praise. And all I remember is I, there was somebody I said, you know, take your finger down her spine. Next thing I knew, man, she started shouting. Remember, she started weeping and crying. She, she started jumping. She started marching around the church. And she came up here, I think, and she grabbed the microphone. And she said, as you were praying, as the church was interceding for her, as she came up here believing God, she had this microphone in her hand. Let me tell you something. We need to shout at her from the rooftop. We need to tell people that God is alive. He's alive in Greenback. He's alive in anything. Yeah. Yeah. To tell what had happened. She said, as we were praying for her back, she said she heard the verters begin to crack. She said they went pop, pop. Pop. I say that's one for the Father and one for the Son and one for the Holy Ghost. And God healed that woman. And she was shouting. You know what I've been shouting to? Praise Amen. God. Yes. To be in all that pain. But you know God sometimes doesn't do it that way. Sometimes He'll use other means to heal us. Yeah. Sometimes we'll have to go to doctors, unfortunately. I don't necessarily like doctors, do you? But we have to go. Sometimes. But God still the healer. And however He wants to do it, it's, it's His decision. But, but she was healed, and I'm thankful. And I am so thankful tonight for this word. I want to go back to the tent door for just a minute. Have you ever been in trouble and it was your fault? You knew it. Let me see your hands. You knew it was your fault. You knew what you had done. You knew it was wrong. Or you knew that what you had done, you shouldn't have done. But one of the great things about this message tonight, what a word, that even when it's our fault, God will still get us out of trouble. Amen. Even when we've done wrong, even when we've not, you know, we're, you know, you like those people on Christmas. You see all those pictures of those angels. They look so good. You got that one angel that's got the halo. You see that the halo's crooked. That's me. That's you. How many times have you and I had to pray? Listen, the prayer of forgiveness. How many times have we had to go to God and say, God, I've blown it. God, look what I've done. God, and God, in His mercy, forget it. This is not in my notes, but God, quick, I'll have to tell you, I've told this before. I remember one time I had really done something really bad, one of the worst things that I ever did since I got saved. And I knew it was wrong, and I felt terrible about it. And I, it happened on a Friday night, and I remember that I didn't sleep good that night. And the next morning, I found myself, I used to go up into this place where there was a cemetery lot, this, the cemetery lot. It was fall of the year, by the way. The cemetery lot was an empty lot. There was no graves in that cemetery. If I ever knew any of you all, if I ever knew I'd stand in the pulpit, if I ever, if I ever knew any of you, I remember that, that I thought this was the end of me. I mean, I literally thought that my life was over, that I had gone too far, that I'd never be forgiven. And you know, it, it didn't matter even if I had prayed to God. I had prayed. I had asked Him to forgive me that night. I had wept. I had felt so bad for what I had done. But anyway, the next morning, early in the morning, on fall, I found myself in this field up there. And I'd been in this field many times before, fellowshipping with God, but now I was out of fellowship. Now I felt like I was away from God. I felt like that everything that I'd ever told anybody was no good anymore because of what I had done. It. The life that I had tried to live, when I did live, had, had, had been shattered by this one event in my life. I even remember that night that, that I had ended up going to a funeral home to try to make myself better. And I walked in. And there was this little itty bitty girl who was probably seven years old who walked up to me. And I remember what she said to me. She walked up to me and looked at me and said, I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you. I like to, I like to just lost it right there. I was looking at this little girl that was so innocent and so so pure and, and thinking that that's the way that I need to be. That's the way that God wants our life to be. Like a child, he said, like childlike, you know, pure. And to live that holiness, to live that sanctified life that I've always preached about. 
And then the next morning, as I said, I found myself up in this cemetery lot. And I was in agony and I was weeping before God. And I, I little did I know where I even was because when I ended up, I remember that day it had been raining. I had, and actually, there was rain and the sun had come out and it was raining. It was a warm day. It wasn't a cold day. I'll never forget it. And, and I wasn't paying any attention because I was so distraught. Ever been that way in life, so distraught that you couldn't even look up? That's the way I'm sure that Sarah probably felt and Abraham probably felt. They didn't have control of it. They didn't understand what was going on. Before I knew it, I, I didn't realize that when I had fallen down, I was up there by myself and I had fallen on my knees. And when I did, I had fallen under this great big oak tree, like in the plains. It's a huge tree. And in the fall of the year, you know, the leaves are different colors. How many people know that? And the leaves had changed on this tree. And I'm sitting down there, and the rain's falling on me, and I've fallen down on my knees, and I'm down on my face before God, and I'm saying, God, look what I did last night. God, and here's what he said to me. He spoke to me just as clear. He said, what are you doing up here, Marcus? I said, oh, God. Oh, God. Look what I did. He said, he said did you not ask me last night to forgive you? I'm talking about when we get ourselves in trouble. Let's not forget what I'm talking about. Did you not ask me last night to forgive you? About that time, I looked up for the first time, I and when I looked up, I was looking, and here was a pile of leaves. These leaves had fallen off the trees. They had fallen in a big pile. I know that, that, that God had this plan. There's, there's no other way that I could have gone on. I would have probably quit right there. I probably would have just given up on God right there because of what I had done. And I remember looking down in, in this big pile of leaves. And they were piled up and they, and they were all brown and, and, and you got that on the very top there was this one red scarlet leaf. And God spoke to me that day in that rain and said, Son, I want you to look down at that leaf pile. He said, Do you see all those leaves down there? I said, Yes, Lord. He said, Do you see that one on top? He said, that one that is scarlet, that one on the top that is red. I said, yes, Lord, I do. He said, when I look down on you, he said, all I see is the blood of my son. He said, I forgave you the first time you had. When you get in trouble, church, and you don't know what to do, Jesus will forgive you. Jesus will make you hope. Jesus will tell you. He's the blood of the Lord. So much more that I want to I'll stop on this. I'm going to keep you on my The other thing about this message is that when you walk up on me, he knew their name. He knew everything about him. You didn't hear what I just said. <clears throat> so I'll tell you what I mean. I'll show you what I mean. Look at all the things that we've done that are wrong, that are sin. Look at all the, the years that we and all the ways that we went that wasn't God's for a lot before we met Abraham was not perfect. He lied about Sarah. He didn't believe God at first. Not that he didn't, but he, he, he listened instead to his wife and he took Hagar. And to this very day, Ishmael received Muhammad and, 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 and all the, the bands of those people. Even in the Middle East, there's still that war that's going on between Ishmael and and Isaac between this is mine and that, that battle is still going on. But yet God walked up to them 
And let me go even a little bit deeper so you'll see this. There was people in the Bible. God healed. He healed the blind, some of the blind. He may have known when he healed them. They, they had no sin really before when they were blind. But he saw that they would still sin, but he still healed them. He, there were people in the Bible that, that I believe that God came to. And he, he even gave them life. He, he, he even restored them. And yet he knew that they maybe would not even serve him. And that's his grace and that's his mercy. You say, what, how do you know that? I, I tell you what the reason that I believe that is because there will be people in this life and they'll live, they'll have a great life as far, they'll have a great life as far as they may not be afflicted like us. They may not have to go through the things that you and I go through. They may have everything they've ever wanted in life. They may never be bothered. Are you listening to this preacher by the devil? They may they never be bothered with, with, with you know, the things that you and I are, are troubled with and we are, are, are persecuted with. And they may live even up to 90 years old. And, and, but, or even maybe, let's say they even live to 100, but there'll come a day in their life. But God is so good to them because God knows... He, and, he, and, he, and even then, He gave them a chance. He gave them an opportunity. And He called them to come. He knew that they wouldn't come. But He was still good to them. And He knew in His heart, he, he knew that this would be the only heaven that they would ever know. And then when they would die, they would die lost. They would die without Him. And they would go to a place where He would never be again. They were, they were there then, they are there now. Come on, somebody, I'm telling, I'm telling you just exactly like I know how to preach it from the heart of God. That there, there's been people that I've met, that I've, that I've ministered to. There, there's been people that you've met, that you've ministered to, and, you, and you've seen them reject God and say, I'll come another time, I'll come another day, but they've never come, they've still not come, they're still the same. They give you every excuse why, I don't, I don't know why I'm saying, they'll give you every excuse why they can't come. They'll, 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 they'll tell you that they're too busy or, or they'll say, I can't come to church right now, I've got too much going on. But my point is, church doesn't save you and, and, and being too busy doesn't send you to hell. But what does send you to hell is when we reject the Spirit of God, when He begins to draw us, amen, He begins to cry out to us he, and, he, and He warns us and He, and he doesn't warn us because He's mad. He, he doesn't warn us uh, uh, because he's, he's, he's upset. He doesn't want us to, to say, hey, I'm warning you because I'm going to slap you out into hell. No, he, he's drawing you to him because he created you to love you. And he created you, hallelujah, so that you would praise him. Come on, somebody. He created you because he has a greater plan for your life. I could have never written the script of my life like it's been written. I thought I was going to play major league. I thought I was going to play baseball in the major leagues. That was my whole heart's desire. Because I could throw a baseball. But it never happened. It never, it never took place. And thank God that it didn't happen. Amen. Thank God that God sets up roadblocks to cut us off when we're going the wrong way, church. Come on. And God turns us around. Hallelujah. That boy that was here this morning. That boy that came this morning with Jennifer, what was his name, Steve? Let's give an example of what happened to their house. Some of you don't know about what happened to them. Their house, was it a house or a trailer? It's a house, though. It's where their dwelling place was, it burnt to the ground. I was going to tell him this today, but I thought I might scare him, so I didn't tell him. I just kept my mouth shut. It was hard to do, but I actually did keep my mouth shut. But I thought, you know, I said, had the devil not, I said, God didn't do it, I thought. I said, had the devil not burnt your trailer down, you may have not been standing here right now today. Amen. Let me tell you right now, thank God when you're afflicted. I know that's hard for some people. But if you ever notice when you're really afflicted and you're really in trouble and things aren't going your way, thank God, look at somebody and say, I'm glad things didn't always go my way. Because when you're afflicted, and things aren't going your way, and everything's not with the silver spoon and, and the silver lining, as my wife pointed out the other night going down the road. She said, you see that cloud up there preaching? I said, yes, honey, I do. She said, you see that lining around that cloud? I said, yes, I do. She said, that's the silver lining. Hello? Woo! Glory to God. But life's not always like that. Come on, I'm just kidding. Life's not always that way. 
And it's not that way for a reason. Because right behind that cloud with that silver lining is another cloud that has a storm that's coming behind it. The storm that's going to make you cry out to God. That's going to allow you to wake Him up again in your boat. That's going to say, Lord, do you care that we not perish? Do you not care that we're about to see Him? God gets up in your life and says, I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere, amen. And let me tell you right now, God never left, we left. God never stepped back, we stepped back. Glory to God. But I want to tell you right now, thank God. But things always didn't go our way. God made Abraham two promises that day. He makes that same promise to us. Number one, He made a covenant with us. And He promised Him an heir. He said, and He told him that Sarah would have a child in her season. But then He wasn't done. But then, see, the, the last thing and the last part of my message is that God will tell you things to come. He will, he will share his most intimate secrets, which I call, He will reveal things to you that He does not reveal to everybody. He will tell you things and show you things that will just literally blow your mind because you know why? Because He's the only one that knows about it. Now, for some of you listening that's not been here, I want to share this with you. Me and Jamie moved to Green Bank, Tennessee. And Jamie, she, she's bobbed the bill. This woman can build anything. She's really good with her hands. And I'm saying, I mean, she is. She's incredible. And she worked real hard in her house. I helped her just a small smidgen. And, 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 and you know, but, you know, she's like her, her daddy. You know, daddy back here can build anything. You know, and, 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 like, and, and she's also like her mother. You don't want to get out of line. And then she said, get back in line there, son-in-law. But I'm standing there admiring this beautiful home when it was finished. Looking at this home and just proud of how good it looked. Man. And I'm just kind of talking to myself Nobody's home but me. And I heard the Lord interrupt my thought. He said, I, I thought, well, man, this house looks great. And God says, yeah, but you missed something. He said, he said, you forgot something. I said, what's that, Lord? He said, there's dust in the window. Said, Remember the preaching about that? It's become a book to me. It's become a way of life. He said, there's dust in the window. said, what does that mean? It means unless God reveals it to you, you can't even know about it. Mm -hmm. Unless until God shows it to you, you'll never even be able to do anything about it. But when He reveals it to you and He shows it to you, come on somebody, then you better do Amen. something about it. Amen. Amen. But you can't do nothing about it until He reveals it to you. Come on somebody. You can't do anything at that time because you don't even know that it's there. But when God says, hey, let me tell you, my most intimate secret said, I want to show you something. I want to tell you something that you don't know. Does he mean it? Did he tell me that because he was mad at me? Did he even mean it in the context that there was dust in my windowsill? No, he meant it in the spiritual aspect of our life. He meant it in, in more of a broader scope than I could ever even put it into words. I try. I, I do my best, but I'm just a man. But I understand one thing about God, that when you're a friend of God, God will come and tell you the thing that you need to know in your life, and that's all that matters. And he told Abraham something about his life, two people that he loved in his life. Number one was his wife, and number two was his nephew Lot, which I preached about this morning. He said, I'm getting ready to send two angels to Sodom. He said, I'm going to destroy the city. And immediately... He, he, God already knew who was in the city. God didn't come to him and say anything to him about Lot. He never mentioned Lot to him. He, it was Abraham that brought up Lot in that city. But God knew. See, God will sometimes want to see how much you really love something. Amen. He might want to really, under, you might want to really check your heart tonight and say, do I really love this in my life? Am I really concerned this much? Is it really something that matters to me and that is the utmost important? That's the way Jesus wants it to be in our life. That's what that was meaning. That was the prophetic utterance of it. That there was somebody in his life that needed to come out of that place that he needed to come back to where he truly needed to be. And he began to say to God, Lord, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he got all the way down. He said, Perk, did you, Lord? Finally, he got down and he began to say to God, God, if there be ten in the city. He said, will you spare it for ten? And God, the last time God spoke to him, God said, for ten's sake, I'll spare it. You know what? 
Let me show you God's mercy. The people missed this. This is something we all miss. There wasn't even ten in that city. All there was was Lot and his wife and his daughters. How many was that? He might have had, I take it back, he did have some sons-in-laws. I don't know how many. But they, 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 but the thing is, they weren't righteous. They, they didn't believe. They mocked him and made fun of him, remember? So if you look at it really, according to this word, besides his wife and Lot and two daughters, it was four of them, and three of them made it out. So God went beyond what He said. God, in His mercy, will go beyond. In His grace, will go beyond to save us and to deliver us. My God, we want to shout. God will go beyond. He said, you stop it. But let me tell you right now, God said it to be more. God said, if that sheep's going astray, we talked about the dumb sheep this morning, amen. If that sheep goes astray, if there be one, Abraham stopped at 10, I mean, yeah, at 10, but God said, you know what, I, I, I'm, he said, I didn't spare the city, but he said, you know, I did something greater than spare the city. I saved them alive and brought them out. My God, you want to shout, God's going to yeah. save us and bring us out, amen. amen. So, amen. so what does that mean? means that God will save your family. Amen, brother. It means that God will never forget His promise in your life. It means that it doesn't matter what nobody has said, what the doctors say, what the lawyers say, what people say, God will have the final say. Come on. God will have the final say. Let's give God praise. We say I said I want to ask you this question. Will you believe God? That's the first question I want to ask you. And the second question I want to ask you, I want you to raise your hands, I want you to ask you, are you a friend of God? If you're a friend of God, let me see your hand. Amen. Raise it up high. If you're a friend of God tonight. God loves Sarah so much. God loved her so much that even though she laughed. You know what? People say, she didn't have no faith. If I was 77 years old and you tried to tell me that I could have a baby with my wife, I'd laugh too. Now maybe I wouldn't. I don't <laughs> but my point is this. God loved him so much and loved her so much that he put it in their heart even though she laughed to name that baby Isaac. Did anybody know what Isaac's name meant? Don't you? What it meant? It meant laughter. You can't get around God. He loves you too much. Hey, can you think that you can get around God? Do you know how big he is? Do you think that, that hey, Reese, I mean, Reese, you kill people in football. I mean, you knock them in the next year. But God's hand's so big. He's not going to let you get away. Look at me. God is so huge. He said, well, you know, whether you can you flee from me? Whether can you go from me? How are you going to get away from me? God is, uh, we didn't pursue God, did we, did he? But God pursued us. Well, maybe you did pursue him, but I didn't pursue him. I never cared anything about God. I was the enemy of God. But you know what's the great thing about God? This is the greatest thing about him. He makes room for his enemies. He loves his enemies. He says, I've got a place for you at the table. Now let me ask you again. How many people said... That I'm a friend of God. Well, let me say it again. Amen. You want a place at the table, correct? Yes. Come up here with me. and stand and make a place up here. I want to. Uh, I'm a friend of God. And you're the friend of God because you're blessed tonight with faithful Abraham. Come on around, Jesse. Come on around, Jesse. Come on around. Come on around, 
You know, Michael, I want to say this about Reese. I hope I don't cry. I'll try not to. You know, Michael came here from you know, a school in Knoxville. And I really had prayed and said, God, I said, you know, Michael doesn't really know nobody. Reese let it be known right off the bat. He said, I'm going to tell you right now. He said, I'm Michael's friend. And I've got his back. And I said, Fair right, good. <laughs> That's what he said. I mean, he said, I praise God for that. And you may be friends ever since. And I'm thankful for that. But my point is, see, even when you're a stranger in a strange land, God's going to take care of you. God, God's going to send, if He doesn't send His angels, He'll send the right people to help you. He'll send the, the right word at the right season in your life. And that's what I love about God. Amen. I want to sing this song. It's my favorite song. And, and then we're going, to, we're going to do one more thing before we go. That's our program for today. I'm Bill Witte thanking you for listening to Redneck Theology. Your questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology, that's all one word, at gmail.com. Please join me again next time for more Redneck Theology.